Um, thank you. I don't have much time to make introductions, but I um, I just have 15 minutes. So I wanted to uh, thank, because this is a great opportunity for me to share the framework I'm presenting to analyze the relationship between capital markets and central banks, um, their functions. And I'm doing this through the role of debt management and monetary policy. So this is a proposal, a framework proposal. And uh, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is why is this important? Why uh, debt management should be studied from the monetary policy framework? And uh, why this is so relevant for capital markets and central bank functions? So um, despite that, uh, and I, I will demonstrate its importance, but despite of its importance, uh, monetary theories from heterodox and orthodox perspective uh, have neglect, neglected the study of debt management and uh, the implications for capital markets has been completely omitted. So that's why this is important. So um, as we have heard in different discussions and uh, the framework that I'm using, we live in a pure credit economy. And this term pure credit economy was developed by Victoria Cheek in 1992 in the evolution of uh, the, the uh, uh, banking system. So uh, she's describing this economy that is, I think, the, the one we are, that we are living, uh, where debt has a principal role in the economic growth. So this means that uh, debt has also a principal role in monetary systems and policies. So um, we know and we are living and we are experiencing uh, that the economies around the world are uh, uh, with high level of indebtedness. And from this uh, indebtedness, uh, governments are participating with more than 50%. So uh, governments are heavily in debt. Uh, so um, it is important to know that and to know that in this type of economy, the economy that we are living, debts are higher than deposits. So the, the question that follows is how we pay these debts if we have for current obligations, we have, uh, we have higher current obligations than deposits, how we are paying these debts? And the answer is uh, we are creating more debt uh, to pay uh, current obligations. And this is a framework that is used by uh, Professor Jan Toporowski. And um, which, which is the part that is very interesting in this framework is that debt is not, or the, the trade of debt is not uh, the simple exchange of assets that we can see in equities or in a, any other type of exchanges, but it's the exchange of a promise for a liquid asset now. And uh, we have uh, seen in different uh, discussions during this uh, symposium that this is very important to know that it, it, time uh, has important implications. And right now, debts can create assets from almost nothing. Um, so I'm using this framework of uh, liquidity related policy because for me, it's very important to unify debt management and monetary policy. Because for me, and I'm going to explain this further, uh, is they are the spine that sustain this pure credit economy. Because uh, that capability of converting promises in liquid um, so uh, liquidity related policies are giving this uh, this environment uh, to allow these exchanges. So. Um, why are they important? Because uh, the current role that central banks have as uh, lenders of last resort, I'm not sure, is it my connection? Also. also. My, my connection, can you hear me? Yes, we can. And maybe at this point, I wanted to interject. Um, did you say you wanted to present slides? Um, so we we don't I'm we not, don't we don't see a shared screen. Give me one second. Uh, I have 
issues with my internet and also presenting. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, I thought everyone was seeing, but I was. Um, I don't know how it, my computer is. Uh, I don't know why I cannot present my screen. So I think now what I have. Yes, we can see the slides now. Thank you. OK, thank you. <laughs> So thank you. So uh, what I'm saying is, uh, I was saying that uh, these liquidity related policies that integrate uh, this term integrates uh, that management and monetary policy uh, have a big power in uh, in allowing these promises to be converted into liquid assets now. So um, uh, uh, because central banks has this uh, power of uh, lenders of last resort and also because these liquidity related policies have the uh, the power of determining the basic condition of the system and that is the liquidity and its risk uh, and they do that through throughout the issuance of debt and its management and also uh, setting up the interest rate in the systems. So uh, also capital markets have facilitated this trade of uh, debt massively uh, around the globe globally and uh, as we see in the current economy, uh, they dominate the financial system and the economy. I don't know if it's uh, first of all that uh, oh. debt was creating this power of the of the capital markets that are allowing this uh, trading of of debt massively, or is uh, capital markets and its development that has uh, 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 evolved this importance of debt? So that's an important question. So uh, something important to know in this type of economy, poor trade economy, uh, the principal source of profit generation is in capital markets, is not in the real economy. And that's very important. So uh, this is the literature review. Uh, I can share that afterwards because I don't have much, much, I don't have much time. But what I want to share with you is uh, this framework Chick Toporowski that I'm creating to analyze uh, uh, debt, uh, public debt and monetary policy and its relationship with capital markets. So um, the first important thing is that debt is the economies with the aggregate debt or aggregate uh, obligations are higher than deposits. So debt in this, uh, as I said, debt in this uh, economy, in the current economy, uh, has the job of generate liquid assets. Um, why? Because we need to pay off this debt, otherwise the system will be unstable. And this is something uh, that has been analyzed by Henry Simons. He was a, a Minsky's professor, but I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, so what are the requirements of, of, of this system to be uh, sustainable? So the first thing is that capital markets must contain all the transactions of the system. This is very important because debts are just uh, exchanges of ownership. And every time debt is changing ownership, uh, liquid assets are created. So it's very important to contain all these within the system. And this is, if you want to uh, have more reference for this, this is the Kalevskian fable uh, that is uh, spread by Jan Toporowski as well. But uh, it shows what we, we the importance of that. And uh, I wanted to say, uh, even though the system uh, or uh, people, private agents are trying to be out of the system and making transaction, transactions out of the global financial system. This has been impossible because for example, cryptocurrency, uh, stable currency are uh, backed by US dollar. And every time they are backed by US dollar, uh, they are in, inside the system. Um, the next requirement uh, we need for that to create, to have to do its job of creating liquidity is 
certain liquidity in the system. So we need this liquidity that permits that these uh, obligations, these commitments are complied. So we need uh, uh, an environment of trust and confidence that uh, allow us uh, to expect that these uh, commitments are going to be satisfied. So in this sense, uh, the liquidity capacity, the liquidity or the capacity to exchange uh, promise into liquid assets uh, involves not only uh, um, the risk and uh, the stock of money or, or the different definitions of money, but also uh, involves trust. And we have seen that uh, uh, the expositions yesterday and Katarina was talking about this is an integration of how contracts, contracts in the system are set. At, uh, and this is very important. This is part of the definition of, of liquidity, how collateral markets are. This is part of, of this definition of liquidity. What is the role of central banks in creating this external liquidity, the role of agents in creating internal liquidity? In other words, for me, uh, liquidity involves or the complexity of the system. So uh, because uh, in the system, this liquidity can be created by agents, but uh, sometimes when uh, their expectations are not met because of uh, um, uh, agents are not rational, and because uh, markets are not efficient, the system needs governments uh, that are sustain this uh, system through, and this is very important because governments provide this trust to the system, but also governments need, needs, uh, governments need these uh, capital markets to work well to satisfy their liquidity needs as well. So um, the system needs public policy intervention to fulfill these uh, uh, unsatisfied needs and also for their own uh, liquidity needs. So this is uh, uh, something that I think is very important is that these liquidity related policies uh, give central banks the, uh, and the central should be um, can you hear me? This yeah. determines the of of in capital markets it, within other uh, things uh, because they set uh, benchmarks to set what is the risk risk floor for the financial market, and this can be seen in the public yield curve. For me, that is a very interesting tool to understand the risk of the systems and the liquidity. Um, so, because also this is very important for agents and central banks to make decisions. So, because I'm doing this from a heterodox perspective, uh, it's been very difficult to, uh, uh, to uh, integrate this framework with the analysis of liquidity and financial risk. Because as we know, uh, uh, the heterodox framework is uh, talking about uh, uh, the fundamental uncertainty and actually uncertainty. So uh, it's been difficult to uh, integrate both. So um, there are three uh, main economies that have studied the management within financial, uh, within monetary policy, and they are Henry Simons, uh, Minsky's professor, James Tobin, and uh, Professor Jan Tuporowski. I'm just going to say that uh, for Simons, the source of, uh, of the system or the business, uh, business cycle's aggravation was um, that people wouldn't be able to pay their debts. Uh, because he is analyzing how uh, liquidity is integrated with the collateral markets and uh, how is this affecting the whole financial system and its stability. So uh, how much I time I have for three minutes? Three minutes left. He studied that management uh, from a different perspective, uh, but what is important is that he is defining um, uh, that uh, Capital markets are uh, uh, and portfolios of people are making decisions within these portfolios, and that has very important uh, implications of, 
of issuance of Oh, hold on one second because okay so conclusions very quickly uh so this is very important this study of data management within monetary policy and i think that uh, this misunderstanding of isolating them uh, has created this uh, misunderstanding of the financial system of capital markets um the other thing is that debt and the way that is created uh, should be this in the center of uh, public policies and capital market analysis and debt management and policies should be thought and implemented. Uh, and the liquidity is the liquidity needs they have. Uh, it's what intimately connect capital markets. Uh, so. Um, Sorry, Marina, could you repeat that last point? You're breaking up. Being uh, part of this. Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> Sorry, could you repeat that last point? Uh, it was breaking up quite substantially. Um, so I'm just repeating that uh, Henry Simon. About the liquidity of uh, in the collateral markets. And he's talking about, he's saying that this is the source of business aggregation. And this is what Minsk is. Well, then we have uh, Tobin that is not studying this from a portfolio perspective. And uh, the different thing from his time is that uh, as capital market profit generator uh, um, of the company, uh, their decisions are not just about the liability management and on the collateral market. So, uh, and lastly, uh, capital markets and governments uh, have promoted both the development of this pure credit economy because uh, capital markets allow this easy uh, transformation of promises into liquid uh, assets um, and public uh, policies with uh, public ma debt management, uh, open market operation, non-conventional monetary policies have provided uh, also this uh, power to debt and, and the stages that we are living in this pure credit economy. Thank you. <laughs> Great. You so I much. hope you could hear everything. <laughs> yes, and the slides were helpful. I think we, you were directed us quite nicely to the slides. So I think whatever uh, we missed then, we can also touch uh, on again in the discussion at this stage. If there's yeah. any questions um, that anybody has, we can, we'll collect um, a round of questions. And then after all of the presentations, then we'll have the speakers uh, give their response to those questions. And so I don't know if there's any hands raised. I don't see anything in the chat at this stage. Um, so perhaps if you do have a question for Marina, feel free to raise your hand now or post it in the chat. If there isn't anything that comes up at this particular moment, we can also save it for right at the end when we actually have the discussion. I'll just give a minute. Right, uh, just one comment that um, I didn't know that uh, Victoria Cheek was the uh, originator of the term pure credit economy. And you're going to be hearing uh, me talking about pure credit in my talk as well. So there's some <laughs> synergy there. Great. Thank you so much, yeah, Ali. Sure. Great. Now we'll move on to Kiko. Um, and so Kiko, you can start sharing your screen um, and then we'll take a round of questions. So we'll repeat the same format with each uh, presentation. We'll take a round of questions and then right at the end, we'll have a discussion. And like Alex pointed out, um, hopefully some synergies across the different uh, presentations. Uh, so Kiko's presentation is what, uh, what has impeded private capital to close the trade finance gap. Um, and there we go. I can see your screen and happy for you to start. Great. Um, so uh, you can also hear me, I think. Great. Um, so uh, thank you, Christina.
Um, thank you, Jay, for having me and thank you all for listening in. Um, so I'm going to present my uh, PhD research proposal. And um, it is about the international political economy of trade finance. And the way I'm going to pursue this with you all is um, I'm going to give you right up front the research question. Um, so you know where this train is headed. And then I'm going to do three things. Um, I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about trade finance and what the trade finance gap is. I'm going to um, talk a little bit about theory and really to educate uh, the hypothesis that I'm um, presenting to you. And then uh, thirdly and lastly, I'm going to make the case why trade finance or the trade finance funding channel is the right place to look at. That's what I'm going to do. So um, the research question is that I'm, I'm going to be asking, or I am asking in my PhD proposal is, uh, what are the impediments for market-based finance arrangements to emerge in um, trade finance? And um, you're going to say, um, geez, you know, what is, uh, um, a trade, uh, what is trade finance and, and how do you define uh, market-based finance arrangements? But I think the important thing um, for me to mention here is that um, currently in, in trade finance, there's sort of bank-based arrangements which are dominant. And whereas um, uh, in many other markets like real estate or consumer finance, you have already this new and innovative way of doing credit, which is market-based finance arrangements. And I'm asking the question, why isn't this particular funding channel still the sort of, sort of say the old um, alchemy, the dominant form? So this is um, so the background to the to the research question. Okay, so what is uh, trade finance? So let's assume that you have um, your producer in Boston and you uh, produce uh, some some bolts and you want to ship them um, to a client in Kuala Lumpur. Um, if you ship it from Boston to Kuala Lumpur, you have sort of a, let's say three months uh, where this where this product is on the road. Um, and if you instead would have shipped it from Boston to New York, um, you would maybe take one day, the shipment would arrive in New York at, the, at your customer site, and you would be able to then send the invoice and whatever you have arranged would get the money, let's say, right away or within 30 days or so. But if that happens only three months down the road, the process for you sending the invoice and, and starting the collection process is sort of extended by this. And um, because the customer would idly say, geez, if I don't have it on my side, I really don't want to start uh, the payment process. Um, and you, but uh, you, on the other hand, in Boston, you already are done with, uh, with, uh, with, your, with your work and you idly want to have the money uh, um, right away. And so in two thirds of the cases on the globe today, uh, the companies sort of find a way and how they finance this time gap between going from Boston uh, to uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And that's called trade credit. Um, but when there's a third party coming in, sort of bridging that, um, and that is to say that the, the party in Kuala Lumpur doesn't have to pay, but the party in Boston gets the money, that's sort of what is trade finance. And that's sort of the area we're talking about. And since of global GDP, about one sixth um, of um, the GDP is financed through trade finance, this is sort of the point to make that this is important. Okay, so I think I, I what I'm try what I've tried to do is establish what we're talking about, um, and on what is the next step for me to tell you is that this is a significant big market. You could have guessed it with the one sixth of the global GDP. This sounds massive, uh, and this adds up to almost ten trillion US dollars uh, annually globally being lent out um, through um, in, in terms what is trade finance, and that's mostly a bank based um, channel. And what I'm touching here now is that this is a well-documented, let's say, problem uh, that there's too little of it. Uh, for the past 10 years, at least, there's estimates of the, that there's too, too little lending of in the in the amount of two and a half trillion US dollars per year. Um, and um, the research that's out on this, either in academia or in uh, the multinational uh, development banks, where much of it uh, is being researched, um, they all think of this problem of too little credit being available to companies.
companies and therefore uh, not enough or companies being deprived of the uh, economic development opportunities um, by not being able to wait that long uh, through the banking channel. And um, it's either uh, how to get more banks involved or how to get it cheaper for the banks, but no one really asked the question that most of us here, I think, at least could ask, uh, knowing sort of the, the uh, shadow banking um, question is, why is it not being taken over by market-based uh, arrangements? And so um, now that takes me now to a bit of theory. So when you look, uh, and this is now in an, in an international political economy um, body of work framework, um, there is a huge body um, of uh, research that discusses from the early modern times, let's say the 15th century, until today, what drives transformation? Because if you remember, the question I'm asking is, why hasn't it transformed from banking into the market-based uh, form? This is, the, this is what I'm um, trying to, um, to answer. The, the international political economy, um, big body of research, has, um, has many, many ways in how they answered it ever since uh, um, 1400s. And you can see here sort of on this page, what I'm trying to do is that there are sort of the explanations to various lenses. So, you know, from the left here, I'm going through it. Um, if it's sort of the nation state that drives it, or if there's sort of the individual that's explaining it, or if it's here, number three, sort of the idea is um, heading the train or um, so sort of that the environment in which we are in is driving the train. Um, that as we come closer and closer um, of the events happening today, let's say uh, 20th century, 21st century, um, um, the, um, um, uh, there's, there's more and more discrepancy of these explanations happening and that there's now a subsection within international political economy called critical macrofinance, um, where they say it's, um, they identify there's a huge gap in the explanations on what drives transformation in the financial system, and that, and that they really say it's what the driving force is, is sort of uh, the private um, credit money innovation and what's driving innovation and them gaining a public backstop that really uh, explains or really touches the story of what, what's really happening in the background. Um, and, and, they, and they are therefore filling the gap of uh, so the charterless bias and the essentialist bias, and I think both of them, or at least the charterless bias, we have heard today already um, many people referencing that that is sort of a, a bias uh, that's quite often out there. Anyway, um, um, so um, again, sort of the bank-based to market-based jump, why hasn't it happened? You can see that um, um, it's... Uh, Right, I made this point, and I and I'm and I'm repeating this, but I think most of us know this that the ability of let's say the old bank, uh, the old alchemy, is that bank-based finance arrangements have the ability to create money by issuing deposits. That's the old, so the the old uh, within the modern times, the old alchemy, and market-based finance creates money by creating securities that trade at par and are thus money-like. Right. So uh, market-based finance does so by pooling a, a wide variety of investors that can provide funding at lower rates. So what I'm what I'm trying to say is that in the old bank-based uh, environment, it's really the bank that's providing the funding, and the the new jump is that there's more and more investors that more investors are pooled in uh, in order to keep the credit to make the credit. And so I'm coming up with a mental model. Um, and uh, which you can see here in the second half of, of the slide, where I say in principle, it's the following. You have a need, someone who, someone who needs funding. You have an instrument that deals with getting that need satisfied. And then you have a source, sort of from the source, the instrument gets it to, to the need. That's sort of the simple model that I'm constructing. And I say in the old uh, alchemy, modern alchemy, and um, I make an example, there's a real estate project that that will get a loan from the source, which is the bank, and the bank can source this by um, creating deposit as a means of payment. I think that's just, um, this is um, old, old alchemy. And the capital market lending, you have the same. Uh, you have sort of a real estate project, but now that gets funded through a security, and that means that the source is, first of all, there's a securitizing uh, process, 
and that uh, and then this securitizing profit in itself then gets funded one step further down through risk hedging um, that's happening through derivatives and, and the security uh, being used as a collateral, right? And that's how you make um, the security um, like money like. So old stuff for for most of us here. And just to get slightly ahead of myself, the reason why I come up with this model is that I now look here at the uh, on the sourcing part, and I can see the securitization. I don't think is going to be a problem because we just saw it's an almost ten trillion um, dollar annual market. So, and and it's it's the amount of uh, the volume of of these um, uh, loans is huge. Um, and so, therefore, the collateralization is not going to be an issue. So, um, I'm putting sort of the money on the risk hedging that's that is missing or is not there in an amount that that market based finance arrangements are dominating this um, uh, this funding channel. So, um, I'm now want to come to my third point, and that is to make the case why trade finance is um, is an interesting. Um, um, Part of the financial model to look at this, because we know that um, it's. I made the example of real estate where this has already happened, and it's uh, the market-based finance arrangements are dominant, but um, this has not happened equally in all um, parts in all funding channels within the system, and um, you can see that it makes sense in some areas not to have um, come up. Uh, as a dominant factor, when you think of, for example, as infrastructure financing. If you think of infrastructure financing, it requires sort of a 20 to 30 year span. And if that requires risk, risk hedging, you will, find an, uh, you will find a very hard time on a market basis to get risk hedging. At least I find this very intuitive. But why not, why not trade finance? Trade finance has an incredibly low default rate. So it's very, very, there's very, very little risk that is uh, connected with trade finance. As there's less than 0.5% of all um, trade finance loans um, that annually uh, glo and globally are defaulting. And it's also very, very short term. So if you want to get out of the risk it, you, over time, you could uh, very quickly get out of it because it would just get repaid. On average, that's uh, around the world 90 days. Um, so, um, so, and just to, to make a point that the story that I'm telling here is not a complete fiction in my head. There have been many um, market attempts or industry attempts in the last 15 years. I'm, I'm, I've identified at least three and a fourth one happening at the moment. that are trying to do exactly that. And I'm just asking the question, so why hasn't it happened yet? So to um, to uh, finally make a point why trade finance is interesting. So I've tried to speak to a range of uh, uh, key opinion leaders. Uh, this is here on the left hand side, um, economists at the Asian Development Bank, um, which is sort of the major um, multilateral development bank with research on this, that all made the point that they have worked uh, a long time on this and trying to make this happen. Um, I've also had a chance to speak to uh, a private bank, uh, in this case, uh, JP Morgan, and um, the global head of trade finance. And he said he would love to uh, get um, trade finance in a way in which they originated and then could distribute it because the balance sheet is very fought over within uh, JP Morgan. Um, but the question still hasn't been answered. Um, on the right hand side, you see um, the senior scholars as well within our YSI community that also have lent time to this project as a further co uh, confirmation mm -hmm. to me, there be something in there. And, and um, with that, um, this is the last slide, I'm, I'm summing it up. The research question, why hasn't, what are the impediments of market-based finance arrangements to emerge in trade finance? So the hypothesis is on risk assessment, on risk, on the risk hedging. Um, how it is written out here is, that I'm trying to understand the, how risk is assessed. So perhaps it's a it's an information problem. Um, here at this point, you could also think trying to um, get the hypothesis in a way in which, and this is now where I'm hoping, uh, where where I, I would I would welcome comments on anything, but to think about the sort of the hypothesis or the method and how to try to make this point, how to in a in a in a scientific way. Uh, perhaps another way, a second way of thinking about this could be trying to uh, make the balance sheet and see 
uh, and try to connect them with the flow. So you you kind of find out you need certain balance sheet, you need these risk hedging, but you then can maybe potentially find out that there is not risk hedging opportunities for those um, to come up, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I think as a, as a final line on this, it's supposedly in the first step, or I want to make in a way that in the first step, it's a, um, a macro financial analysis. And so sort of in a second step, then try to get the international political economy um, into this, where then try to identify sort of the groups that benefit from the status quo, how it is today, and those who are fighting to, and, the, and which are which are there to change it and, and make an outlook how this might look in the short, mid, and long term. And with that, I give it back to you, Christina. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kiko. Um, I see there are a couple uh, comments and questions in the chat. Chris, um, are you here? Oh, Alex, let's take your question first. And Chris, if you would like to pose your questions out loud, you can do so. Yeah, so I think it's really fascinating, this question about why trade finance hasn't transitioned to market-based finance. Uh, and it's particularly interesting because, in a sense, uh, trade finance used to be market-based, or or maybe, um, I don't know, would you characterize the 19th century uh, market for bills of exchange and prime bills as a form of kind of market-based trade finance? Yeah. And hold your thoughts on, <laughs> on, on that, Kiko, for now. <laughs> we will get to responding to the questions later. Um, Chris, I'm not sure. There, there's a question from Chris in the chat. I don't know if he wants to repeat it. But if there's no other questions um, at this stage, then Alex, I'll hand over to you for your presentation. Um, and then similar again, we'll take questions, and then we'll engage in the discussion later. Um, Alex, so your presentation is on right. money and hierarchy. Yeah. Uh, you thank, thank you, Christine. Screen. No worries. Um... There we go. Um, so I've posted the paper to the chat. The paper is called The Many Faces of Money and Hierarchy. I presented a version of it at a conference past summer. Um, I've revised it a bit since then, and it's still a work in progress. So any feedback uh, is welcome. For money viewers, uh, this paper really provides two things. It gives you some handy dandy diagrams for communicating about money hierarchy, and it uses the building blocks of hierarchy to really integrate the price level with the other three prices of money, uh, par, the interest rate, and the exchange rate. So we saw Perry talk about the price level yesterday, but he left out the central point that I emphasize in this paper. And that is that the key thing to understand is what I call the monetary stability constraint. Um, and that is basically the inability of the price level to move too far, too fast, without compromising uh, money's ability to be used as money, to be money. So now I'll walk through the diagrams and we will see how the monetary stability constraint uh, connects up with what we already know from the money view. Oops, how do I go to the next one? There we go. Okay. So this is five goods trading bilaterally. There's no money. So each of these gray circles is a good. Uh, and then they're connected with these dotted lines, which represent prices. And the dotted line, my convention in here is the dotted lines represent prices that are free to move. So it's floating prices. Uh, this, for any reasonably sized market, is, is an untenable situation for all the obvious reasons. Um, you know, double coincidence of wants. How do you set prices efficiently if all the prices are between two goods? Um, no good. We can't do that. So what we need is a settlement standard. Um, so I'm defining money to be the standard settlement instrument. That's how I'm kind of using the term money uh, in this paper and in this talk. Here, what's happened is one of the goods, one of the commodities, or which we're just imagining is gold, um, uh, has become the standard settlement instrument uh, for this market. Uh, this circle now has these black dashes on it. So that means it's not only a commodity, which is the gray, it's also a form of money, which, which is the black. So it's a hybrid of both. Um, what we can do here is we can simplify this diagram by consolidating all the goods into one circle representing goods. Uh, so now we have uh, uh, kind of a credit relationship. And this is credit in the sense that... Um, uh, 
that Henry Dunning McLeod defined it, um, where he said that credit is anything you accept uh, because you can it can be exchanged for something else. So its value comes from from kind of its exchangeability. Uh, so money, I labeled it money here, but you can still imagine it's gold. It's still you know the alternating black and gray for the for the commodity money. Um, it's really a claim on goods at this point. Like the reason why people are using it is because it can be exchanged for any of the goods. Um, and what is this price here? Um, this price between the cir two circles, that's the price level. That is the price level. So the price level comes in first. The fourth price of money is now the first price of money. Now, this price level isn't being actively stabilized or anything like that, but presumably we chose the particular commodity we chose, such as gold, because it had a reasonably stable price in the market. And well, that's part of part of what, uh, what you need for something to, to be money. Um, so that is... Um, commodity money. Uh, money is a claim on goods. Um, so now, uh, oh, and, and I should note that, that these are hierarchies already. This is, this is a hierarchy right here, right? Money is a claim on goods. Like nobody had to impose this hierarchy. It just comes, it just emerges kind of from the bottom up by the very fact that you have money claiming something, right? Goods are above money here. Um, I know that some people might disagree with that characterization, but that's kind of what I'm going with uh, for the purposes of this presentation. Um, so here we've extended the hierarchy even further. We're imagining the existence of banking and deposits are promises to pay cash. So uh, in, in my little notation here, the solid black line uh, represents a par relationship. So that's fixed one-to-one -one price. Um, and that is that, let's keep moving. Um, and I wanna emphasize that not all deposits are money, right? Only demand deposits are money because you have to be able to turn it into the higher form of money on demand. And that's what makes it so that other people will accept it as money because, well, you don't need to turn it into money. I can do that after you pay me or something like that. As long as they believe this, they trust this power relationship, that's gonna stay good, you can make payments. Um, there are other deposits such as time deposits and that kind of thing, which are in themselves not a form of money, even though they're promises for money, right? Right. Um, you can't get money right now, but you can get money in a week or whenever whenever the deposit matures. Um, so that's I've, I've represented a broken line here. And that's kind of like almost par, but it's not quite par. It's kind of there's like a discount to par. Um, so that um, you can think of that as, a, as an interest rate right there. So we've got par, we've got the price level, we've got interest rates. You can kind of see where this is going. Um, and yeah, let's move on to the next one. So I wanted to I, I didn't do any balance sheets. Um, but this is this is the slide where I really could have used a balance sheet because it's really hard to see how loans create money unless you actually have the swap of IOUs on the balance sheet uh, that you guys are all familiar with. Um, but really the loan, um, when you borrow money from a bank, um, it creates the loan and it creates deposit, which are both promises for money, uh, but they're going in the opposite direction, right? The loan is the bar is the promise of the borrower to, to repay the bank and the deposits are a promise from the bank uh, to the borrower that you can you can withdraw your cash. Um, another thing here, notice that I don't have goods up here. Goods are still up there. They're just not in this picture, right? They're still above cash. The monetary stability constraint is still there. It's there throughout. Um, so that is um, that. Is that. Um, Another way to represent the same thing. So here I kind of have them side by side, but really loans and deposits aren't at the same level of hierarchy because you can also think of the loan as a promise for deposits. You can just return your deposits to the bank and that also cancels out the loan. So this is really probably a more appropriate um, hierarchical representation. Loan below deposits, below cash, and then goods are up there uh, off the edge of the screen. Um, now we can talk about ha having like a multi-layer uh, par hierarchy. Um, and this is, um, you know, it's kind of what we have with correspondent banking. It's what we have with euro dollars. Um, so here, what I have is kind of a correspondent banking thing where these the big city banks have deposits at the central bank, and then the country banks um, use uh, deposits at the city banks for their reserves. Obviously, it's more complicated than that. You can you can fill in more details. Alternatively, it could be Euro European banks down here having deposits in U.S. banks, which have deposits at the Fed. Um, so everything at every layer of the hierarchy is equally money, and at each level of the hierarchy, um, you're facing the the banks are facing a survival constraint. I should also quickly notice that uh, note that I've labeled these according to the institutions that are issuing the instruments, but really these are all hierarchies of instruments. Like Perry talks about hierarchy of institution, hierarchy of instruments, everything, all of my pictures are hierarchies of, of, of instruments. So this is the liabilities of city banks uh, are money here. Um, so uh, everybody faces a survival constraint. And as long as you're able to meet your cash commitments at every level of the hierarchy, everything here remains money. Um, 
so let's see. So here's what happens um, when you are not able to maintain your uh, your par with with the with the layer above you in the hierarchy. So uh, one option is that when par breaks, uh, this stuff on the left becomes not money anymore. It's demonetized. We all know how that works. That's boring. I'm not even going to show it. So instead, what I'm showing is you know people were using this money enough over here that it actually stays money after after par was violated. So now you have two monetary standards, and the price between them is these dotted line. Uh, this dotted line. It's no longer a par relationship now this is a floating exchange rate but guess what there's st in order for it to be money uh that's someone that? saying something oh that's a uh yeah um so uh yeah but guess what in order for something to stay money it still has to be stable with respect to goods i'm not showing goods here but there's there's a constraint on really kind of this exchange rate on how far it can drift at least how far the band uh can drift in which the exchange rate uh bops around um so now we're getting into um, back to the top of the hierarchy again, um, a commodity standard versus a pure credit standard. So both of them, you have to have monetary stability. And like I was saying before, with the gold standard, you're just kind of piggybacking on the market price of gold generally being stable. If you know suddenly an asteroid full of gold hit the earth and there was too much gold, you know that would ruin your monetary stability. Um, but you know that's not going to happen. Uh, nevertheless, it's maybe not as stable as it would be for an ideal money, that kind of thing. So that's a commodity standard. And then on the right, we have a pure credit uh, monetary standard. And that means that the central bank's uh, liabilities are the monetary standard. Instead of something above the central bank's liabilities being the monetary standard, the central bank's liabilities themselves are the monetary standard. And that uh, monetary standard has to be actively stabilized with respect to goods. Otherwise, you're not going to um, you're not going to be able to achieve uh, monetary stability. It doesn't magically it doesn't magically happen on its own. Um, and the black circle that means it's it's pure credit money. It's not commodity money anymore. It's not this alternating thing. You've got pure credit money here, pure credit money here. But the difference is that the standard at the top is pure credit uh, on the right. But it's still the same basic principle, right? You need monetary stability. It's how do you achieve it? Um, so this I, I felt was useful uh, to put in here because the relationship between the treasury and the central bank is just like the relationship between a firm uh, and a bank that the firm is borrowing from, right? Um, so if it was a firm, the treasuries would be the loan and the central bank would be the bank. Um, it's uh, it, uh, There's been some debate about like where in the hierarchy uh, should the central bank be with respect to the treasury or something like that. Structurally speaking, in terms of who's using whose liabilities as money, uh, the treasury is below the central bank. And the central bank holds treasuries as assets on its balance sheet, just like a bank holds your loan uh, on its balance sheet as an asset. So I felt thought that was important to, to bring in here. So now let's really, um, we've got this two different monetary standards that have a floating exchange rate between them. Let's bring the goods back in. This, this just shows explicitly um, the monetary stability uh, constraint um, here. The monetary stability constraint is always there in the background. But notice that I didn't put these two standard monies at the same level because really the issuer of this money is using uh, is still using uh, this, this guy's money as, um, as money, right? And it's not going the other way. It's a one-way relationship. So um, this one is using this one's liabilities as money. So you, you can't... Um, Floating exchange rate doesn't mean you're equal. It's still it's still a hierarchy, and we know that. We know that today. We know that um, you know the United States uh, does not use uh, the Fed doesn't use euros as money, whereas the ECB does use dollars as money, for example. Okay, so now what happens if there's financial stress in the system, and it looks like people are going to start violating par, and maybe there's going to be debts defaulted, that kind of thing? Um, there's kind of a choice uh, that the central bank has. Um, uh, this I'm showing a pure credit standard here, but it would be the same choice uh, in in a gold standard. So you can either um, honor the constraint that is binding you, or you can uh, violate the constraint above you to relax the survival constraint above uh, below. So on the left we have um, uh, debt. Uh, uh, below money, uh, and it's connected by an interest rate or kind of an att attenuated par relationship. Um, if you force uh, monetary stability to stay uh, and you're the central bank and that's what you care about, you're, 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 I think Anoush was talking about this earlier today, the central bank, you know, kind of throws everyone else under the bus and allows the, the economy to collapse in the name of maintaining monetary stability. That's it, this right here. Now everything, you know, your, your interest rates and your par all, all broke down uh, below. 
Alternatively, you can temporarily sacrifice some amount of monetary stability to support financial stability uh, in your market. So that means allow a little bit of inflation, or if you're on the gold standard, go off gold for a little while. Um, obviously, you need some degree of monetary stability for money to keep working, um, but there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, so you can do that to kind of accommodate uh, the strains in the financial sector. Um, now we're getting towards the end. Oh, this one, um, this is the, this is to emphasize that the gold standard, the international gold standard is a floating exchange rate regime. We think of it as kind of a fixed power relationship because everything is a promise for gold above one to one, but really New York gold is not the same thing as London gold. So if we look at this from the perspective of the New York market, um, you have uh, dollars which are promises for gold, that's fine. But what if you need to make a payment in London? What if you need gold in London? Well, you could get your, you, you could turn your dollars into New York gold and then ship it to London, then it becomes London gold, but that's a really expensive operation. So what you probably want to do is you want to get some sterling denominated foreign exchange, foreign bills of exchange um, that are claims to gold in London. So you just buy those and then your gold is already in London and you don't have to ship anything. The only reason you would ever um, ship gold uh, from New York to London is if the um, the, the price of foreign exchange uh, gets higher than the price of, of, of shipping gold to London. So this is the gold import export points. And that, that price, the price of foreign exchange, that's the exchange rate. That's this price here. That's why we call it an exchange rate. It's the price of foreign bills of exchange. Um, now we can talk about the breakdown of the sterling system. Um, so, uh, you know, whatever stresses in the system made it so that there was a, you know, could no longer maintain par between, um, between sterling and gold in London. So I'm not even showing gold as being a form of money here. It's just another commodity again. Gold is still a form of money in New York because the dollar is still um, pegged at, to gold at par. If you're thinking about this from the London market, um, then you're using dollars as money, um, which is kind of indirectly using New York gold as money, but you're still not really using London gold as money. I don't know how well this analogy holds up. Obviously, it's a lot more complicated than all of this, um, but at least it gets you some practice looking at these kinds of diagrams. Okay, so here's a modern international monetary hierarchy. The reason I have this in here is because there's the do dollar hierarchy, which is this little sliver over here on the left. Um, that's not the whole international monetary hierarchy. Um, so the dollar hierarchy is a par hierarchy, but you also have yen, which is floating, and pound sterling, which is floating, euros, which are floating, and then uh, Chinese yuan, which is complicated. And I don't want to pretend to be an expert on that because we had so many experts earlier today, but maybe it's kind of managed in a kind of stabilizing way with respect to the dollar. Um, so that's that's at least how I've drawn it here. This doesn't have to be necessarily realistic. So now uh, we're getting, this is the second to last slide. Um, so here again, we're showing the gold standard as a floating exchange rate system. So here, down here are the floating exchange rates. The um, pound sterling is at the top of the money hierarchy. Um, well, actually gold, I suppose, is at the top of the money hierarchy because we're still thinking of gold as money here. So everyone's pegged to gold one-to-one, -one, but there's still floating exchange rates uh, between the individual currencies due to the gold points, et cetera, et cetera. And now here's the payoff. This is today. Today, gold standard. Today, gold standard. Today. Okay, so today is basically the same as the gold standard, um, except the monetary stability is not being enforced by uh, pegging to gold or pegging to a commodity. Instead, what you're doing is each of the central banks is managing monetary stability directly through inflation targeting, that kind of thing. You still have floating exchange rates. They work the same way. Dollars at the top uh, instead of sterling, um, but it's really um, the same kind of thing. Now, importantly, I want to say that the monetary stability constraint is not the same thing as purchasing power parity. So purchasing power parity says that if exchange rates are flying apart, then price levels also have to be flying apart uh, at roughly the same speed or something like that. This is an absolute constraint on how far price levels can move in general. Um, so that kind of constrains everybody individually and then everybody collectively too. So purchasing power parity is still a force there, but there's room to move around because it costs money to ship and everything like that. Interest rate parity is also uh, a constraint and that comes into play, uh, especially when central banks are trying to stabilize the price level, right? They're moving around interest rates and that affects 
prices. That affects interest rates uh, internationally and relative interest rates internationally. Um, so you can imagine all the different ways that that stress would build up in the system um, because of these different uh, constraints that, that are kind of competing with each other. So then a kind of the, the question I want to leave everybody with is how do you manage these constraints so that they don't step on each other? How can you how can you manage the system um, or how can everybody kind of collectively manage the system and live in the system in such a way that these constraints aren't 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 um, interfering with each other? Um, I think to uh, do, 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 do well, kind of I, I just want to emphasize, as we've seen the whole way through, the monetary stability constraint limits what money can do and what we can do with money. And it really shows uh, that the price level is a price of money that fits into the hierarchy neatly with the other ones. Uh, I presented this paper over the summer, uh, and Perry Merling was there, and I asked him uh, what he thought. And he said, you did fine. And uh, that wasn't what I wanted to hear. What I wanted to hear was, oh, I hadn't you know thought about that before, or this, you know, makes me think about something different or something like that. Um, but hopefully it's more useful now because honestly, when I presented this paper before, I had these diagrams or something like them in my head, uh, but there were no diagrams in the paper and it's really about the diagrams. Uh, so that was problematic. Great. And Thanks. there's my contact information. Fantastic. All right, we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much for that very interesting presentation and we'll have tons of discussion later. I don't know if anyone wants to pose, there are some questions in the chat. Does anyone want to pose a question out loud at this stage? All right. If not, then um, I will then call up Claudio. In the meantime, uh, the other yeah. presenters can start taking note of the questions that are in the chat that they would like to respond to. After Claudio's presentation, then we'll uh, begin with Marina and, and go uh, from Marina to Claudio in responding to the questions, and then we'll get into a discussion. Um, Claudio, do you have any slides you'd like to share? Yeah, yeah. Uh... <laughs> Can you see the slide? Perfect, yeah, can see it. You can go ahead, okay. thank you. Okay, this is a, a work, uh, thank you, first of all, for having me. And uh, this is a work of, of uh, history, money and financial history, and history of economic thought. This is uh, from a chapter of my dissertation, and that is a work in progress. And uh, it is uh, focused on the uh, 17th, 18th century. Um, and uh, in this particular case, this is an introductory chapter. chapter. Uh, I would like to uh, present, uh, to compare the two models uh, of uh, the Bank of Amsterdam and the Bank of England that in my view are based on two different concepts of money. But uh, first of all, let, let's see what is the imaginary money, uh, because in the ancient uh, regime monetary system, uh, the unit of account is imaginary. It is, uh, is not issued, so it is split from the means of payment that is actual money. Then a process of stabilization against uh, the metal uh, bring uh, the the the, mon the imaginary money to uh, a form of uh, uh, metal standard that is the uni unit of account is uh, um, unified with real money and it's the case of uh, gold standard in england and bimetallic standard in france uh, this is uh, an example from the napoleon's french franc in 1803, when the number is inscribed uh, for the first time on the reverse of the coin, meaning the unification of uh, means of payment and unit of account. And, uh, but this happened before actually in the United States with the Coinage Act in 1792. But let's see uh, what is uh, the, the importance of imaginary money, uh, because it, this is from Luca Fantacci, this, uh, this chart. And, uh, uh, well, it, it made possible for, uh, for the sovereign to, um, to change the, the metal content of the coins through the mint, uh, either reinforce or debase the coin. On the other hand, he could uh, change the nominal value, keeping stable the metal content. And so he could enhance or de abate uh, the, the nominal value of, uh, of money. 
changing the tariff. And in this case, uh, the uh, enhancement is equivalent to the debasement. It, it could be used to uh, increase the seniorage, power debtors against creditors, uh, offset deflationary pressures on the economy in case of scarcity of money that was uh, very common at the time. But um, this uh, possibility gave also, raised also some problems. For example, the debasement that was studied by Kinderberg in the 90s, uh, and in particular the case of uh, Kipper und Wipperzeit, the great inflation in the first half of the 17th century in the Holy Roman Empire. And this chart is from Kinderberger that show, uh, shows the uh, fragmentation of the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, every, every area that you see uh, is a circle with uh, autonomous monetary policies. And so there was a competition between the means uh, several means in, in the area uh, to the base uh, coins uh, in order to achieve uh, higher uh, seniorage. And so according to Gresham's law, the good money was melted down to be recoined in lighter and lighter uh, money. And uh, this uh, reflected also on the exchange rate because uh, uh, there was a problem in the market of asymmetric information and uh, transaction costs uh, to uh, uh, assess the quality of coins. And so the foreigners asked for a, for a premium for exchange, exchange uh, the, the currency. And uh, as Adam Smith um, highlighted in the Wealth of Nations, this was a problem for the exchange rate especially in the Netherlands, but also in Northern Italy that had the, the same problems of the Holy Roman Empire. The solution was to the foundation of uh, the first public banks in Genoa, Venice, uh, uh, Amsterdam in 1609, Hamburg, Nuremberg, um, uh, with the uh, aim to create a bank money that was stabilized uh, uh, against the current money and used for the settlement of bits of exchange. So it was a, a first kind of uh, stabilization. Another uh, stabilization happened in England with the Great Recoinage in uh, 1696. In this case, uh, uh, <clears throat> the problem was that the silver coinage was uh, in mostly clipped and also undervalued with respect to uh, silver bullion. So the traditional solution was to uh, change the nominal value of the, of the coins, at least the sound coins, to e equal uh, the value to, to the value of bullion. And in fact, Newton, for example, wrote uh, in making them uh, the intrinsic, uh, extrinsic value coins of equal equal value, it seems more reasonable to alter the extrinsic than the intrinsic value of, of money. Okay. On the other hand, Locke uh, claimed that altering the standard by raising the money will make great confusions in accounts, bargains, trade, and defraud the king in all his settled revenues and all other men in their revenues and debts. So it was a doctrine uh, in defense uh, of creditors, and in fact, two years before uh, the Great Reconage, which uh, uh, at, at, uh, reaffirmed the, the, the principle of Locke, the Bank of, of England was founded, and it was actually a partnership of creditors uh, uh, of the king, um, and we will see that in a, in a moment. The solution was to uh, fix irrevocably the, the, mm. the currency to precious metal. It, that was uh, the, the birth, uh, let's say, of the gold standard. So we can see that the two models can be represented by the two most important institutions. Uh, on the one hand, the Bank of Austria, and on the other, the Bank of England. These are uh, the, the assets. Uh, 
by being sale uh, the balance sheet structure in the 18th century because uh, the Bank of Amsterdam did not survive to Napoleon. And you can see that in the case of the Bank of Amsterdam, the largest part of the assets is the yellow part, that is precious metal. While in the case of the Bank of England, it is the, the red part, that is the, the usual loan to the sovereign. Okay. These are the, the balance sheets. For the Bank of England, you have uh, in the asset sites the specie, the loan to the government, exchequer bits, bits of exchange, and uh, in the li liability sites, deposits and banknotes. Uh, for the Bank of Amsterdam, you have uh, in the asset side specie, but in this case, uh, it's uh, divided in the encumbered coins and unencumbered coins because uh, the Bank of Amsterdam in the uh, at the end of the 17th century, made a, made a reform and uh, gave a receipt for each deposit, stating that the deposits, uh, uh, the previous deposits, we, uh, which didn't have a receipt, were uh, unredeemable. So only one part of bank money that, that is in the liability side was redeem redeemable and in part. Uh, are redeemable and this is uh, so the birth of uh, fiat money or quasi fiat money then there are uh, uh, in the assets also the loans to the government but a small part of loans to the government and to the dutch east india company uh, the difference uh, between banknotes and bank money banknotes of, of the bank of england are paper money substitute for specie they are convertible, they are fiat money only in periods of inconvertibility. Uh, the bank money of the Bank of Amsterdam is ledger money, complementary to specie, not fully convertible, quasi fiat money, and the agio uh, is the exchange rate between bank money and current money, and it is stabilized by open market operations. So there are analogies here between the Bank of Amsterdam and the modern central banks, uh, as uh, Queen and Roberts that uh, had studied uh, a lot the Bank of Amsterdam wrote. Uh, they say that since uh, the 70s, central banks have been shifting their monetary liabilities uh, uh, towards uh, accounts. Quantitative easy, uh, focused on creati creating central bank reserves to open market purchases of long-term uh, securities. Central banks rely on repos for the short-term stabilization of policy rates. Uh, in fact, uh, repo and receipt uh, uh, are quite similar, allow counterparties to control their bank money and the safe assets that act as collateral. So they conclude perhaps the Bank of Amsterdam was their centuries ahead of its time. And there is also a, a paper uh, of uh, the BIS, uh, an, uh, an early stub of coin, uh, that, uh, well, uh, mm, uh, made some points. Uh, they stated that uh, the bank money is, is similar to stable coins. So my conclusion here uh, is, uh, is not uh, part of my research because uh, I'm studying the 18th century, but uh, it is important for me to understand the, the, poten the potential of this uh, model. And uh, so what potential, uh, what limits uh, does the Bank of Amsterdam uh, model of today. Um, well, the, there are uh, some, as we have seen, uh, some similarities. And so, uh, for example, the, uh, the stabilization, the possibility of st stabilize the unit of account through assets that can be securities and commodities the possibility to issue stable, co stable coins. We have seen the, the stable coins of central banks, 
the management of the of the agio okay, that is uh, well the agio is the word uh, uh, used in the past to uh, uh, um, well it, it is uh, the exchange rate between the the assets and can be <clears throat> with the, the vocabulary of uh, fairly merely can be called the part and uh, well, the Bank of Amsterdam used uh, for the first time open market operations. So my well, this is uh, there are these are some suggestions to um, that uh, need further research. But if you have some some idea on that, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Claudio. Um, so at this stage, if there's any specific questions for Claudio, feel free to post them in the chat, or you can raise your hand um, if you have any questions. Um, after we've collected questions for Claudio, we'll then start with Marina, um, Marina responding to the questions she's received, and then uh, Kiko, Alex, and then Claudio. And then after everyone has responded, we'll then get into a more um, uh, open discussion around some of the themes that have been raised. Um, all right, if there's no direct questions being posed to Claudia, Marina, I'll give you an opportunity to respond to the questions in the chat and any other uh, comments that you might have for the other uh, presenters as well. Marina? Um, I think uh, the only question I, I got uh, was already answered. Um, so I don't know if there is any more questions for me. Karen, you're muted. Uh, well, I have a question uh, because I think you went a little bit, a uh, little bit too far when you said that 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 profits were created in the credit system, uh, based in mostly uh, nearly exclusively. I mean, the credit system, of course, is at the capital markets. Of course, are dependent on the so-called real economy. I mean, uh, shares. Uh, Shares depend on, basically anyway, dividends that are paid out of firms' profits and so on and so forth, on which leverage is executed uh, in the markets. But, but uh, I mean, to, 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 to go aboard, I mean, if you say that this is a credit, um, credit money system, uniquely you, you, you overlook the other side, which is central bank money. I don't know if you... Uh, deliberately do that or not but i mean this is sort of what we have learned here the money view that there is a an interaction between these sort of types of of money uh, so i would like to hear what you think about that sometimes the people who discover something uh, you know totalize it and uh, forget uh, what, what, what is other aspects for other aspects thank you yeah, I had to be uh, very fast with my presentation, but um, it's good to have this type of scenarios to uh, realize that we are missing something. And this is just a, a theoretical framework that I want to use to analyze the relationship between central banks and, um, and uh, capital markets. Um, so if I understood well your question is, why am I missing the... Uh, money that is in central banks, like the asset side of the balance sheets of, 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 of central banks, or I, I could you explain better your, your question? Because maybe uh, everyone here is familiar, familiarized with uh, the money view. And um, uh, for me, this is all very new. Um, so I want Did to you... understand where are you coming? Well, I mean, it's just anyway. a simple question. You said that 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 profits were created in capital markets, and I disagree yes. with you. I disagree with you. That um, profits are so, created also in the uh, basically in the real economy, of course. Yeah, yeah, what I'm saying is that it's uh, capital markets are the principal uh, uh, source of profit generation. Uh, because of uh, the way capital system is working, the way the way is concentrating uh, capital. So uh, uh, if you see there, for example, and you can see this in financial institutions, uh, um, 
the way they are generating profits within the capital markets is, is tremendous. It's not even compared with uh, with the profits that are, that are being generated in the real economy. So what I'm saying is uh, this capital concentration and this uh, attractive way of producing a profit that are, it's even easier and higher than in the real economy is what is creating uh, this, uh, this role that capital markets have in the current economy. But so I'm not saying... No, I'm just saying there's an interdependency when, when profits uh, decrease in, in, in the economy, uh, so will capital markets also suffer or we, or we enter crisis. So it's not a simple relationship where they stand uh, side by side and, uh, you know, you can just say 80% of this and 20 of the other. I mean, th these are completely interrelated uh, relationships. Right, but um, what I'm saying is that... Uh, uh, I mean, the way the, the capital market markets and the technology that we have now, it's allowing to produce profit money from nothing. This is our uh, profits within the whole economy. Yeah, okay, I agree with that. I mean, that's all a kind of concentration. Great. I think um, maybe we'll move on to a couple other questions and we can pick up uh, this conversation a little bit later in the discussion. But thank you so much, Marina, uh, for, for your response. Um, uh, Kiko, I think you were up next. Uh, would you like to respond to the questions that you received? Yeah, um, thank you, Christina. Um, so to Alex's question about the 19th century being a market-based finance system um, in the Sterling system, I assume. Um, so it, it's not in the in the definition that I've raised that it's securitized. Um, I don't I don't think that was happening. But uh, the Sterling system was um, was built around trade finance, and there was, as as I understand it, there was there was uh, there was traded prices, market prices on this, and. Um, Merling was um, Perry Merling was citing the Hicks uh, 1989, the market uh, theory of money, and this is really all based on on trade finance. And reading that gives me sort of a clue on how important. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we talked about this. So this is uh, this is uh, this is a great inspiration. I still have to read um, uh, Badgett uh, again or more closely and on how tree the one that you had you and Perry have discussed um, to get more sense on this. But the risk um, sharing or this default um, um, insurance, uh, for lack of a better word, as a um, the, that is being implemented back then seems to be a very key, at least in how um, Hicks explains it. So, um, um, and um, I think in the chat, there was the question by um, um, Marta on the factoring and uh, forfeiting business. And I, this is not in traditional trade finance, but it's sort of in the wider scope of working capital that sort of happens once the product has arrived on site. There's, there is huge amounts of um, securitization happening in receivables, and I'm kind of wondering why there and not sort of the step before. Um, and so if any any pointers on these cup deals you mentioned, Marta, I would be happy to receive them. And um, thank you. Great, thanks, Kiko. Uh, Alex? Yeah, so I got a few uh, different questions. Um, uh, Marta made a comment, which is that gold is a special good. In practice, banks deal with paper gold and physical gold as kind of two different things located in London, New York, and different places. Um, I think that's. I think there's a sense in which gold is a special good, but the main sense in which gold is a special good, according to how I'm looking at it, is that we happen to choose it as our monetary standard. And there were various things that went into that choice, uh, various properties of gold that made it a, a potentially useful uh, monetary standard. Uh, but that's the main thing that's special about gold is that we're using it as money. I I'm that's sorry, I, I was a gold dealer at the National Bank of Hungary, mm -hmm. so I know very well that they, as a uh, as a part of the National Bank, as a dealer of the National Bank of Hungary, during five years I was engaged in gold desk. Cool. So I know very well that yes, in monetary system we have to think and in the market, 
it's practice. I am I am practice uh, practical banker. Uh, they are too. There is not in theoretical for theoretical people, but we we use we deal with two types of uh, gold. The first that is so non uh, people gold that you have not physical allocated gold, and the second there is that you begin to deal with the physical allocated gold. There is, and the two type of accounts, there is only, for example, uh, uh, Fed New York account without allocation, or you have, for example, uh, Swiss uh, Central Bank, Loco Zurich. It's so that in that case, you have allocated deposit gold. And that's why the that is the big difference if you have paper gold and you have only and you deal only on the differences of uh, of exchange rates of gold or you have practical physical gold and these two types of gold the central banks and the gold dealer use for not uh, uh, knowing if you will physical buying gold or not because in that case they make for you a special quotation that is not normal. And we do a, a practical, uh, we, uh, we, uh, with this uh, uh, paper, so paper gold, the central banks begin to uh, to see what's happened on the market. And then they say, oh, this, this, uh, this uh, 10,000 uh, uncium, I will buy. OK, Pretty wow, that's good. really interesting. Um... I but will defer to your expertise types, on that. Um, I there think there is two types of gold. Yeah, and I and in all the conferences, I practically I speak about this because you couldn't find in the manuals about these two types of gold deal. Yeah, uh, and I think um, what you're pointing out is is kind of um, going to be an issue if anybody anybody's on an expert of any of the specific things that I talk about in my paper. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more detail there um, that is important and that I've you, left out. What you uh, <clears throat> have, uh, what was in the slides, it was mm -hmm. the difference between the physical and paper gold. Where is the the gold? Yeah, the bills of paper? exchange being the paper gold. Yes. Yeah, the foreign exchange yes. is the paper gold. If yeah. there is paper or or if it's physical gold. And if you have physical gold in London and in paper gold in in New York, the situation on your slide have to be changed on the opposite. Yes, that's right. They can go both ways. That's why I speak I speak about these two topics that look uh, yeah, two, two, two cool. types of gold. I, I want to get to a couple of the other questions really quick. Um, okay. So Jorge was asking where euro dollars fit in uh, on this slide. Um, there's going to be more dollar hierarchy uh, down below this big dollar at the top. That's the Fed dollar. So all the euro dollars are going to be promises for dollars in the U.S., which are promises for dollars at the Fed. Um, that doesn't mean that there have to be a lot of reserves or anything like that. Uh, but ultimately, it's kind of that's where the credit relationship is. Um, so each of these different um, monies is going to have its own um, hierarchy below it in in uh, denominations. Nominated it in that. In that it depends where the where the 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 uh, where the uh, where is settled, and dollar is settled in New York. That's why you have it here in your slide. Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm gonna stop the share and get to the next question. Um, so uh, the next question, uh, Larissa was messaging me in the chat. Uh, she's like, "What what is the axiom, axiom and what are you demonstrating? Uh, and I think that was a good question because maybe I wasn't super clear. Like uh, maybe the the slide seemed like, you know, they made sense on their own and they didn't necessarily uh, flow together in, in a... Um, so the axiom is basically just that there's this monetary stability uh, constraint for money, that uh, money has to be stable or the market will find something else. Uh, to use as its money. Um, so how that constraint um, kind of limits um, uh, what's possible, uh, for example, with exchange rates is kind of what I'm demonstrating. And demonstrating that uh, today's international monetary system is not so different from a gold standard system, because gold is merely the vehicle through which the monetary stability constraint is, 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 is being imposed. Um, so that was Larissa. Uh, Perry asked, who imposes the monetary stability constraint on the central bank? Um, is it a story about uh, competitive monies like Hayek? Um, I think it is kind of a story about competitive monies, because if you don't have enough monetary stability, people will leave and, and you find something else uh, to use as their money. Um, but the main thing... That
I'm uh, emphasizing is uh, that um, it's, it's, it's constrained by the nature of, of money, that it can't be money if it's not stable. Um, so whatever you're using as money, however you got there, it has to either be stable on its own in the market or be stabilized in some way. Uh, and there's no way the dollar is stable on its own in the market because it's a, a pure credit instrument. So it has to be, has to be stabilized uh, by the central bank. Um, Perry had another uh, comment here where he says uh, the monetary, he thinks of the monetary system as infrastructure for the market economy. I think of it that way too. Although I have to comment also that like sometimes Perry, you're emphasizing it's infrastructure. It's not a veil. I think when infrastructure is working well, it looks like a veil. That's always, it's, it's functioning. So you, you don't pay attention to it. You're just using it. Right. Um, so I think there's, there's something to notice there about um, some similarities. Um, but obviously you have to know, you have to keep the infrastructure working and that puts constraints on the system and monetary stability constraint is, is one of those uh, constraints is probably the first, the first constraint of money. I would say the price level is the first price of money. Um, do, 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 do. And I'm thinking about, um, in terms of, you, you talk about um, putting goods at the top of the hierarchy. Why am I do, doing that? Maybe it's a different kind of hierarchy. I'm starting with Henry Dunning McLeod, right? And he's he's defining credit as exchangeability for something else. Money is the highest form of credit. Uh, it's exchangeable for goods. It's the, the thing, the standard settlement instrument that's generally exchangeable for goods. Um, so that's why I put goods at the top of the hierarchy. It's a little bit funny to think about the top of the money hierarchy having something that's not money. Um, but I I think this is a useful um, way to think about it. Um, and I think I will stop with that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alex, for covering all those questions. Um, so maybe a last word to Claudio, um, if he wants to respond to some of the comments in the chat or uh, maybe- Well, I, there, is a, there is a comment here by Chris, uh, who, who is uh, surprised uh, by the fact that uh, the Bank of England uh, had uh, more specie than the Bank of the, the Bank of Amsterdam had more specie than the Bank of England. Well, uh, actually, the, the gold standard was a, a theoretical uh, uh, system because, uh, in practice, uh, it was a sterling system, as uh, Marcello Di Cecco showed in Money Empire, and uh, the the gold reserve was were. Uh, uh, small uh, since the beginning because the bank was established uh, um, to finance the government and so it was uh, this big loan that this was uh, the the innova financial innovation of the the bank of england having a, a unusual loan in the in the asset side that uh, instead uh, in the case of the bank of amsterdam uh, the the assets were almost entirely gold, uh, precious metal. So, in fact, in the in the charter of the Bank of Amsterdam, it was stated that uh, the bank should have uh, the hundred uh, percent backing of, of the of the species, and all the the, the loans that uh, were done were outside the chart. The charter and uh, so fr from there the idea uh, to of stable coins uh, uh, the com possible comparison of the bank money of the bank of Amsterdam and stable coins and if you wish I I can put in the chat the the um, the paper of the beast if somebody's interested okay thank Great. you. Thank you so much, Claudio. Um, at this stage, we'll maybe take a last round of comments, questions, uh, thoughts, observations, maybe even if the, um, the the presenters themselves have comments on each other's papers, feel free to you know, have a last word at this point. Um, after the sort of last round of comments, uh, we'll maybe have about 10 minutes before the next presentation with uh, Perry Merling and Gon uh, Gonzalo Fonseca. And so we're gonna have a bit of a 10 minute break uh, just to recharge and, and get ready for that session. So um, at this stage, any uh, questions, comments, Comments, last thoughts. Um, maybe does anyone have want to have the last word? Well, I think uh, I mean this was a very diverse uh, uh, sample of, of of papers, um, and uh, one of the problems I think is that um, there's uh, no. I mean, everybody goes into a specific aspect, specific theories, and so on and so forth. 
but the, the general, my gen general thrust is that there's a little bit of simplification going on. I mean, there's an assumption that central banks can sort of control inflation and so on and so forth. It seems to me that, in, 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 especially in later days, uh, this is certainly not the case. The central banks themselves I, uh, don't know what to do. Do they have to? Do they raise interest rates? Do they not? And, and what is the effect of that? The effect is not what they expect to be. Uh, and so on and so forth. And I would like to revert to this sort of uh, concept of uh, Perry that that there's an, yeah, that has been an, an increasing flexibilization, but that flexibilization of markets where everything can be converted into something else, assets to liabilities, especially liabilities to assets, and uh, and so on. So floating around the world through the dollar has also created enormous risk to the system. And there's no and build stability in the system. I think somebody, some people seem to think that, well, there's a stable way here, but it's not. Um, I mean, in my view, anyway, I see increasing risks, but also attempts, of course, at creating stability. Obviously, it's true that, 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 that money ideally should be stable and to some extent that it has managed to be, but there's no guarantee here. And, uh, and there's no guarantee that it serves the purpose that it's supposed to be. Well, this is just all of a general remark that I would like to come with. Um, thank you, thank Karen. You. Yeah. All right. Um, is there any response to uh, Karen's comment? Um, sure. Uh, I would like to uh, go ahead. Great, let's go, Marina, and then Alex. Great. Um, so, uh, thank you for, for, for your comment. I think. Uh, uh, the way, at least for me, the way I'm presenting uh, the role of central banks is not that they are currently doing a great job <laughs> stabilizing the system. And uh, because what I think is uh, uh, the way uh, the monetary policy and debt management is understood by uh, central banks is completely uh, wrong from my point of view. That's why it has to be revised with this new framework. Uh, because this is another important question that you are raising, which is what should be stabilized in these systems? So I'm saying that liquidity, as uh, uh, Henry Simons was saying, that liquidity is the most important thing to stabilize because uh, we are in an economy where uh, debt is higher than uh, deposits. So for me, is that uh, maybe the answer from Alex and his paper is different. Something else has to be uh, stabilized. So I think uh, this is a, um, a, a very nice discussion of what should be stabilized. And, uh, and these papers and these uh, proposals to, to, to present these frameworks different from the current one are saying actually what the central banks are doing, trying to just focus on the interest rates is completely wrong to 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 control uh, inflation. Should inflation uh, be controlled? Um, so uh, these are questions uh, with different frameworks that can be addressed, different from the mainstream uh, uh, monetary policy that we have uh, in our current days. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Alex. Yeah, I do have a slightly different answer on what should be stabilized, um, and the idea is that. Um, you can't have financial stability without uh, at least a reasonably stable money underpinning it, right? Um, so I think you, there's a lot of wiggle room in monetary stability, but it's always got to have kind of its arms around the system. There's always got to be some degree of monetary stability. Uh, otherwise, you don't have uh, a money. Well, really, people find something else to use as money. Uh, and then the liquidity problems are going to be in terms of that thing rather than uh, the first thing. Um, so I think... Um, you know, the, the, Karen, you're bringing up kind of the increased flexibility and the, um, I guess, faster communication. You know, you can trade instantly today, um, especially capital flows can be instantaneous. Um, short term capital can adjust very quickly. Um, you know, all of these things are issues and they, they, you know, kind of relate to the question of like, exchange rates and interest rate parity and you know people want to borrow where interest rates are low and lend where interest rates are high and interest rates can change and that can completely shift everything and 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 cause tension there and it causes tension 
um, with the price level too, because there's not only purchasing power parity um, that is not as precise as interest rate parity because trade flows take time and are expensive, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's still there, like as kind of a fuzzy boundary. But then there's also this monetary stability constraint. Um, so that's that's kind of what I'm trying to to bring into the paper, uh, bring into the discussion with my paper. But you're right that there's a lot of tension and everything's happening faster. So the, the stresses are building up faster. Uh, and that's something we need to pay attention to. And um, I'm not pretending to have an answer to that, um, but but you're, you're bringing up an important point. Great, thank you so much, Alex. Great questions um, and great discussion. So I think at this stage, I uh, will end this uh, presentation session. Thank you for all the comments and for all the presenters. Uh, really interesting um, discussions that we've had so far. Uh, we will have the next session is gonna be starting in seven minutes. And so I'm going to stop recording.